All right, let's get rolling. This is a really special night this evening. I'm, uh, I'm glad you all showed up, and uh, you will be glad you showed up as well. Um, my name is Matt Lindstrom, and I'm, on behalf of the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement, I welcome all of you to the second annual McCarthy Residency at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. This year, we're very pleased to host Senator Dave Durenberger. Um, I'll, stay, I'll say a bit more about his residency in a minute. Many observers, though, of St. Ben's and St. John's have remarked that due to the number of Bennies and Johnnies in public service, there must be something in the water up here. What then does this say about Senator Dave Durenberger, who spent his childhood growing up in Flinttown as the son of former SJU athletic director George Durenberger, who incidentally hired basketball coach Jim Smith and a guy named John Gallardi, I don't know if you ever heard of him. Um, well, in fact, Senator Durenberger has spent the last 30 years as a public servant. Twice elected to the U.S. Senate, Durenberger found his passion serving as a chairman of the Health Subcommittee of the Senate Finance Committee. His, and his service in this increasingly important public policy field is no doubt understood through the importance placed upon hospitality and taking in your neighbors as Benedictine values in the rule of St. Benedict. Since leaving the Senate, he has been named Senior Health Policy Fellow at the University of St. Thomas, no, no jokes, and also shares their national, chairs, chairs their National Institute of Health Policy in the Opus College of Business. He's the author of two books, Pres Prescription for Change and Second, Neither Madman Nor Messiahs. And he speaks nationally on the future of healthcare delivery and policy. While in residency, here at St. Ben's and St. John's, Senator Durenberger will have nearly 30 separate events throughout the week, including class visits, a uh, visit to the St. Cloud Rotary today, interviews with the media, including the esteemed record, uh, several dis uh, panels, discussions, lectures, as well as a tour of the pottery studio. The bookend of this residency, however, doesn't take place until March, when on March 16th, Senator Durenberger will return to St. John's with Vice President Walter Mondale and fellow SJU grad Gary Eichten, host of uh, Minnesota Public Radio's Midday Show, where they will be uh, in conversation and, and, and recording a, a Midday Show. So that's March 16th in the Pellegrin Auditorium. Note <coughs> that for your calendars. I also want to welcome our other distinguished panelists, former Senators Rod Grams and Mark Dayton, as well as Representative Mark Kennedy, and also an SJU alum and longtime friend of the school, and also founder of a fantastic lecture series called the Frontiers and Freedom Lecture Series, which is associated with the Eugene McCarthy Center for Public Policy. And, we've, and finally, last but not least, we welcome the Star Tribune editorial writer and columnist Lori Sturdivant, who will be our exceptional moderator of this panel. Now, you've heard of the stimulus bill. But this is not a stimulus bill, but this will be quite a stimulating panel. Uh, <laughs> let me, please help me welcome Senator Dave Durenberger, who will introduce the rest of the panelists. Thanks, Dave. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here, and it's um, nice to be home. Nice to spend time at uh, St. John's and St. Ben's. <clears throat> and, uh, my dad would uh, like to know that he's now being introduced as the guy that invented uh, football and basketball. Uh, actually, he was a little All-American football player at center and a little All-American basketball player at center when he would play here in the 1920s, and I think that's why they, they hired him. He came cheap uh, as well, which the Benedictines always, <laughs> always appreciate. Uh, and as I mentioned a few times, um, my parents my mother went to St. Ben's and then graduated from St. Teresa's. I don't hold that against her. You're still here, they are not. <laughs> and um, they, ma they married in 1933 and they had me in 1934 in the middle of the Depression when I was all they could afford to have and look what they got. So <clears throat> um, it sort of, uh, it, it sort of uh, made a big Im <clears throat> impression on me when I first learned that my parents were Republicans. And how did I learn that? Because they were working for Ed Devitt, who was a Johnny graduate from Mandan, North Dakota, uh, who was running for Congress in 1946. And then in 1948, they were kind of torn because another Johnny grad, who happened to be a Democrat, decided to run against Devitt. And so my parents had to work against 
the guy who was an assistant hockey and assistant baseball coach at St. John's for my dad in the late 1930s, Eugene McCarthy. But that wasn't the hardest thing for them. The hardest thing for them was later on when Eugene McCarthy decided to take on their son at the end of his first term in the United States Senate. And fortunately, a man that I'm going to introduce to you beat him, so I didn't have to beat him. So uh, let, me, <clears throat> let, let me just uh, present, if I haven't made the point yet, that this is the Gene McCarthy uh, seat uh, in the United States Senate. There are a lot of people in this country who think that, um, <clears throat> hello, <laughs> that um, the United States Senate uh, in Minnesota began with Hubert Humphrey and Gene McCarthy. The whole world began with those two people. And it gave them the impression that this is a democratic state. And if they needed any um, uh, proof that it wasn't, in 1978, uh, both Rudy Boschwitz and I and Al Qui won the two Senate seats and a governorship. And probably if you look back at the governorships in Minnesota, most of them, a majority of them, have probably been held by governors rather than excuse me, by Republicans rather than by Democrats. So uh, what we are is uh, not a mixed up state or something like that or a state that can't make up its mind or anything like that, but we're basically a progressive state. And while today you will see four of the, or hear from three of the successors and one would-be successor to uh, Eugene um, McCarthy, I think what you will see in common among, uh, among all of them is they may be conservative or liberal or s some other def current definition, but um, that they have a uh, stature that they bring to the, that they have brought to the, to the Senate and to seeking the Senate that is uniquely uh, Minnesotan. And ho our hope, I guess, is that at the end of the evening, from the variety that, of responses that Lori will bring out of this uh, interesting group, um, and most of us will uh, probably try to focus a little more on the future than on the past, that sort of thing, um, that you will see some of the strengths um, that uh, we'd like to see in the United States um, Senate. But this is just this happens also to be the only seat in the Senate right now, <laughs> since it's held by Amy Klobuchar. And we don't apparently have a second seat because that's being debated. So what you see here is, is um, all you're going to get for a while. Um, let me start with uh, Rod Grams, um, who lives in St. Francis, Minnesota. And if I might, because she's here, may I introduce uh, Chris Grams? Chris? Hey, there she is. Great. Very good. Um, when I left, the, I, I served the four, last four years of Hubert Humphrey's term from 79 or 78, I guess it was, when I took office until uh, 82, and then I, then I ran for re-election in 1982, and as I've already pointed out, Gene McCarthy and Mark Dayton decided to run against me, unfortunately, Mark beat Gene, mm -hmm. so uh, then I had to take on, then I had to take on Mark, and that sort of began a, a friendship, if you will, um, started out as a kind of a competitive, terribly competitive thing, but it's a friendship that has lasted uh, to this day, and it's another thing that I think many of us, you will see, many of us have in, in common, despite our, our differences. But uh, when I decided uh, after the end of the third term that I served not to run for re-election, there was a congressman who, who um, decided to run for my seat by the name of Rod Grams, and Rod served the, the district, which is, I think, is sort of like the 6th District today, is that, is what it called, the 6th District? It's in St. Cloud, yeah. Yeah, right. And um, so this is, uh, this is home to Rod Grams. <clears throat> he's been uh, electric, in electrical design engineering, he's been in broadcast journalism, he was a, a anchor editor in um, Channel 9 uh, television. He's been president and CEO of Sunridge Builders Incorporated, uh, specializing in solar construction, and served in the uh, United States Senate from um, 1995 to 2001, and uh, served on the Energy Natural Resources Banking, he can talk to us about that, Foreign Relations and Budget Committee. And today he is the owner, president of Little Falls Radio Corporation, KT. <coughs> Okay, KLTF. 
There you go. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, senior advisor to Hecht Spencer and Associ Association, a government relations firm in Washington, D.C. <coughs> uh, Mark Dayton was born in Minneapolis, <coughs> grew up in Long Lake, attended Blake School in Hopkins, was an all state hockey goalie, graduated cum laude from Yale, taught. Uh, um, ninth grade science in, uh, in a public school in New York, was a counselor in the Boston Home for Runaway Youth, then became a, an assistant to Senator Walter Mondale, worked on the 76 Carter Mondale uh, campaign, and then uh, joined the staff of Rudy Perpich, the governor of Minnesota, who appointed him commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Economic Development. In 1982, he had the temerity to run as a DFL candidate. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, I've already mentioned that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's twice. That's, so. Fools rush in where wise. <laughs> yeah, right. He then uh, joined, went back and joined Governor Perpich's second administration, where he served as commissioner of the expanded Department of Energy and Economic Development. In 1990, Mark Dayton was elected our state auditor, and in 2000, was elected Minnesota's 34th United States uh, Senator. Mark Kennedy. Um, is uh, a graduate of St. John's, has already been pointed out, raised in Pequot, Pequot Lakes. There's a lot of Kennedys in Pequot Lakes. There are a lot of them that started there. I remember that well. Um, he is a certified uh, public accountant, has a master's in business administration with distinction from the University of uh, Michigan. In his business career before uh, uh, his interest in politics, he uh, worked for Pillsbury, helped them buy and globally expand a uh, little ice cream shop called Hagen Dazs, right? And uh, was a Fortune 100 senior executive at Macy's and currently is in a global uh, leadership role at uh, Accenture, the uh, consulting firm. He served three terms representing Minnesota in the United States Congress, this area, from 2001 until 2007, and currently he is uh, member of the President's Advisory Committee on Trade Policy and uh, Negotiation. And he ran for the Senate, as I indicated, in 2006, um, losing that election to uh, Amy uh, Klobuchar. Uh, in addition, and I think Matt referred to this, uh, Mark has been instrumental in, in founding at least three, at last count, uh, lecture uh, series. One, the Minnesota Rough Riders, it's the second, the Frontiers of Freedom lecture series at St. John's. And third, and he did this, I think, with uh, Bill Frenzel, former Republican congressman from Minnesota, and uh, Tim Penny, former Democratic congressman from Minnesota, founded the Economic Club of Minnesota. Finally, the person who's going to make all of this work tonight, who knows us better than we know ourselves <laughs> or each other, because she's such a marvelous, marvelous student and uh, analyst of uh, policy and politics as Lori uh, Sturdivant. Um, Lori was uh, born in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She was raised up in Del Rapids, South Dakota, went to Coe College in uh, Iowa, and uh, got her journalism degree at the University of Minnesota. As soon as she got her degree, she was offered a job at the old Minneapolis Tribune before it became whatever it is uh, today. And she's been stuck there ever since, as she said. She is uh, an incredible gift to uh, the world of uh, political uh, analysis. And those of you who have, have the opportunity to read her every uh, Sunday know what I'm talking about. But in addition to that, she has also authored uh, seven books, and uh, many of them, I think, are on Minnesotans and famous Minnesotans. And the interesting one she told us that she's working on now is um, on the Pillsbury family of Minnesota, and uh, one of the wonderful traditions of uh, this state is the role that families have played in uh, our development, and so we'll look forward to that one. Yeah, Dayton will be next, right? <laughs> all right. Anyway, um, thanks again to all of you to be here for being here. And Lori, thank you very much for moderating this program.
Well, thank you, Dave, and what a pleasure it is to be with all of you here tonight at St. Joe's. What a good thing you have going here with the Eugene McCarthy School of Public Policy and Civic Engagement. I love that combination, the, the, the meat of policy and the engagement that pulls in such a good crowd on a weeknight. I'm very impressed. I have a feeling that some of you may be here because you have a, a class requirement, maybe a, a little grade, maybe dependent upon that. I hope that you'll put that notion aside right now and sit back and, and enjoy, but also be thinking about participating. You don't get by without doing that here tonight. It's really a treat to think about Gene McCarthy and how pleased he would be with this turnout tonight. Those of you who had the pleasure of knowing him, and maybe that's all of you. I got to know him through the good offices of my good friend Elmer L. Anderson, former Minnesota governor, been gone since 2004, and this year, were he, were he still with us, he'd be getting ready to celebrate his 100th birthday, and it would be a big, thrilling surprise, a big, a big event for that, no question about it. In 1946, as you heard, there was a congressman from St. Paul, a Republican congressman from St. Paul, imagine that, named Ed Debit. And Elmer Anderson was his campaign manager and fundraiser and worked so hard on his campaign. And then came 1948, and the Democrats reasserted themselves, got themselves reorganized, put up young Gene McCarthy, and knocked Ed Devitt out. And you would think that Elmer would not have been too fond of Gene McCarthy after that. But the two of them, in Minnesota fashion, kicked up a friendship and became such good friends that when Elmer did his last book with me, a book called I Trust to Be Believed, there's only one person he wanted to write the introduction, and that's Gene McCarthy. Gene was about Elmer's age and similarly ailing, but he wouldn't resist, would, would not say no to that chance. And I think it speaks so well of the kind of camaraderie and, and, and uh, uh, the kind of sensibility that service to the public supersedes partisanship in Minnesota. That was the his, that's the legacy that these good public servants came to. And I think we are do well to remember that tonight and then ask some hard questions about whether that is gone for good. Because tonight our topic, the future of policy and partisanship, can begin with right today. With all the news today in the past 10 days in Washington, that's that, that the present is an easy place for us to start tonight, panel. In this election just passed, it seemed that American voters said they wanted change. And they voted for a president who promised to usher in more bipartisanship, more civility, and more openness in government. But today, in the Senate, where three of you had the privilege of serving, Americans saw pretty much the same old, same old. A major legislation was enacted almost exclusively today by one party, with just enough of a bow toward the minority to win over just a minimal handful of their votes. Last night at the press conference, President Obama said that in Washington, Old habits die hard. Tonight, our mission panel, as a panel and as an audience, is to consider whether Washington's habit of highly partisan policymaking can die and whether it should die. Is business as usual in Congress serving America well? And if it isn't, panel, how can it be changed? I'd invite you tonight, panel, to take off your partisan labels and to think of yourselves, think, of, think with us as institutionalists. You are all alumni of an institution that I know you love, the U.S. Congress. And it's an institution that I think most Americans, most of us in this room, want desperately to believe in, but that many find dysfunctional. What do you believe is needed to restore America's confidence in the governing institutions that chart this nation's course? That is the question of this hour. Folks, here's how we're going to proceed. I'm going to ask each panelist to get us started. Each, I know, came with a few ideas to get to share. So, panel, I'll ask each of you to take about two or three minutes to get the ball rolling, and I'll tell you in which order in just a moment. Then we'll discuss each other's ideas, and I'll kick in a few questions or thoughts of my own, and we'll do that till about half of our hour is spent. And then, audience, it's your turn. We are at a liberal arts college tonight, which uh, is a place where critical thinking is prized. So let's uh, give you a chance to display some of that. A portion of your grade is going to depend on your class participation here. So please be thinking of some questions you'd like to ask. I don't know whether there are microphones extant in this audience or not. I see some heads nodding. Yes, there are. So when you have a question in mind and you want to impress your professor, students, uh, wave your hand and someone will come with a microphone and you'll get a chance to get in on these conversations. And when you do, uh, audience, I, my commitment to you is I will keep this moving. That means panel members, no filibusters, please. <laughs> 
Now, seniority matters in the U.S. Congress, so I want to start with our most senior member tonight. That's the Honorable Dave Dernberger, elected in 1978. Dave, I want you to give us the grounding. How did Congress get to be so polarized and so prone to gridlock? Was it ever thus? Uh, let me do this very briefly because when I, uh, <clears throat> when I went to the Senate in 1978 and I was fortunate enough because there were 20 of us Republicans and Democrats elected to the Senate that year. Um, and um, I had, there was one seat on the Senate Finance Committee which everybody considers kind of a plum deal, taxes and trade, <coughs> health care and all that stuff. And I got the seat and within 48 hours I had a handwritten letter from Russell Long of the Democrat from um, Louisiana. And that letter I still have someplace because it traces the long and enduring relationship going all the way back to 1803 between Louisiana and Minnesota. <laughs> and right away, right away, I knew something, you know, was up. And what I discovered was that that particular committee and that particular senator uh, didn't believe you could do the nation's business if you only came to do your own business. You know, that it, it called out something more than that as between Democrats and uh, Republicans. And <clears throat> what I discovered is that he was right, and that's basically the way the committee uh, operated. And uh, one of the reasons I think that it did is because we were in, we were in tough times then, uh, in the late 70s and into the 80s. And we had a balance in the Senate between um, Southern Democrats who were conservative and Northern Democrats who were liberal and Republicans who were both. And you couldn't get anything done unless you could find where is this sort of center, if you will, between um, either the parochial interest or the ideological interest. And that's something that Ronald Reagan understood when he became president in uh, 1981. And, um, you know, he, he realized that he had a Democratic House. He happened to have a Republican Senate. But um, it was a challenge for him and a challenge of leadership to recognize that um, you don't get, as a president, you don't deliver uh, with Republicans if you're a Republican or the Democrat with Democrats. It's something that I experienced with George Bush 41 when he had no Republican House and no Republican Senate that his job was to be president of the country. And whether it was the, the major vote that we had on, on, uh, on the Iraq war, which ended up being like 52 to 48 or something like that, there were Democrats on, on both sides, there were Republicans on both sides, and there was the president in the middle. So that's the, that is uh, a large part of, of the experience that, um, that was my tenure in the Senate, and it's something that I think about when I think about can we ever get back to that <clears throat> balance. It's going to take, in part, it's going to take presidential leadership and tough times, and we happen to have them both now to get us back there. Well, that's interesting, and, and uh, Senator Grams, you're second in seniority here. Don't you love how they sat in order of seniority, folks? It makes it so easy. They just automatically do that in, from, as their congressional veterans. <laughs> I think it's very impressive that you obeyed the, what that instruction. Senator Grams, you're second in seniority as Senator Dernberger's successor. Why don't you pick up the story? Well, I just wanted to kind of build on what he said about being in the Senate uh, and how you're supposed to work for the country, not just for a lot of partisan issues or parochial issues, meaning districts. And I think there's a big difference between serving in the House and serving in the Senate. And I tried to take that philosophy when I was in the House. Uh, you work very closely with your constituents. That's your job. That's your role. If you're in a farm community, you work very hard on farm issues. If you're in a, a, a coal mining town, you work very hard on those type of issues. But in the Senate, you took on a different role. You were a U.S. Senator. You happened to be from Minnesota. But you were supposed to take the big issues into context, not worry so much about bring home the bacon. And that's, I get so tired of always hearing that, that you've got to bring home the bacon, you've got to bring home projects. And how about you even see the fights, even in the U.S. Senate? How about trying to bring the dollars home rather than looking at what is best for the country? Not just my district, not just my state, but the whole country as a whole. How are we going to advance and benefit uh, the country? And then we talk about partisanship, bipartisanship. And I know uh, this president, just like every other president, George Bush, you know, 
43 came in and saying that he wants to unite everybody. Well, you know, that's great. Uh, but partisanship, uh, there is a role for each party to play or each perspective to play or your view or policies. And uh, what Barack Obama right now is doing is evidently not selling very well among some of the Republicans. Uh, glory be, I mean, uh, Republicans seem to have found uh, themselves after wandering for about 10, 12 years, uh, not knowing whether they were Democrats, Republicans, or in between. And, uh, but it's, a lot of times it's easier to be the loyal opposition than the lead, and we've, we've found that out. But I always thought being partisan means being ready and willing to debate your positions and your issues and to take a strong stance. If you want one party, that's one thing. But if you want a, you know, a government that's going to have loyal opposition, minority, majority, you've got to be ready to debate. Debate, debate is healthy. Debate is good. And the American people need to hear the differences between. And they're going to decide. Right now, the majority is in the hands of the Democrats. Elections have consequences. And American people are going to find which direction this party is going to lead. Evidently, and I was one that was very discouraged uh, about the way the Republicans led over the last 8, 12 years. Uh, but they're going, they, were, they decided they wanted to go in a new direction. So they voted for change. They voted for hope or whatever that might be. Uh, but we're going to find out what that is. But in the meantime, I don't think it's bad to have disagreements, to have debates, to have different philosophies, policies, and directions you think the party or the country should go. I think that's healthy. And I think the most important thing is after that debate is done, and I hope that we have it here, some comedy on the, on the panel here, not comedy, comedy. <laughs> and, uh, that, and I always found that many of my good friends in the Senate were Democrats and very liberal Democrats, maybe partisan Democrats, but on a personal level, they were great people. They came, they had a different philosophy, a different bent on life, and that was great. And that's what I remember even, I'll just, before I go too long, but uh, 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 who's the senator from Mississippi? Um, not Trent Lott, but um, Thad, Cochran. Thad, uh, Thad Cochran. And Thad and I used to always, he'd, I'd come up and say, Thad, I need your help on, on a dairy issue. And he said, are you for it? And I said, yes. He said, well, then I'm against it. <laughs> because it was a regional issue between Derry in Mississippi and Minnesota. So, but you learn to work with them, and there were, there's wonderful people on both sides of the aisle. But it's healthy to be able to go out and debate those issues, talk about them, and the important thing is that the American people get to hear these debates, and then they decide who ends up uh, winning in the votes. Well, I'll stop you. there. That's great. Thank you for that perspective. Now we have uh, two marks both elected for the first time in 2000, but senators outrank members of Congress. So Mark Dayton, you're up next. Could you, Mark, envision a more bipartisan Senate than we have today? You, you certainly were there in the aftermath of September 11th. Was it so then? And, and is such a thing possible or even desirable in light of what Senator Grahams was saying? Could we envision a more bipartisan Senate? Well, if I can start by saying, uh, thanking Senator Dernberger for this invitation and just saying how uh, much I respect him and his service to our state, as I do Senator Grahams and Representative Kennedy. And uh, we had a, a, a great debate, a series of debates in 1982, and he got more votes than I did and won the election, and that's the way it should be. And, you know, I, I can honestly say that he, he is my friend in, in the true sense of in the Senate, uh, if you like and respect one of your colleagues, you refer to him as my friend. If you don't like him, don't respect him, you call him my good friend. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't stand him, you call him my very good friend. Uh, <laughs> so I can honestly say that Dave's my friend. <laughs> and uh, I think he's also, uh, I also learned running against him, uh, uh, running against a, a St. John's alumnus, St. Ben's alumnus, is uh, de like trying to take on to St. John's in football. It's uh, definitely a, a, an uphill contest. And, you know, I think it speaks very well to the, the, the tradition you have here of, of commitment to public service and, and both sides of the aisle. Uh, and I also want to pay tribute to, to Senator Gene McCarthy, who uh, I, I was an anti-Vietnam War activist before I became a Democrat, because when I became opposed to the war in college in 1967, 68, 
Lyndon Johnson and the Democratic Party was the party responsible for the conduct of the war. And I can still remember being a junior in college and sitting in my uh, room at the, my dorm and, and watching uh, you know, the New Hampshire primary results when Gene McCarthy pull out, threw, pulled off this phenomenal upset uh, against the sit incumbent president. And I can remember 10 days or whenever it was later when President Johnson got up before the nation and said that he was not going to seek re-election. And uh, you know, that, with that odyssey in 1968 and what Gene McCarthy uh, captured in terms of youthful idealism and support, uh, you know, in a way uh, prefaces what uh, President Obama was able to do in this campaign where he just galvanized the people and, and in a crisis mobilized uh, public support. And that you know, is, is the, the real mantle of leadership. And uh, I would say you know, in response to your question, Laurie, that the most uh, nonpartisan uh, and bipartisan that the Senate and the House were in, in my time in the Senate was uh, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 where we were truly a nation under attack and in crisis, and we were Americans, first and foremost. We weren't Democrats or Republicans. And then within just a, a, you know, two, two weeks, we had the anthrax uh, attack against a couple of members of the Senate. So we had these gatherings where Senator Frist, who was then the, the uh, not the majority leader he would become, but he was the one f physician in the Senate, gave us uh, briefings on uh, you know, how, how to deal with this. If we were gonna have a, a biological attack, we dealt with subjects like what would we, the procedures be if, if a third of us or two thirds of us were, were wiped out uh, in the Congress in a sudden attack. Uh, you know, these were very sobering uh, questions and you know, we voted within a week in the Senate uh, and passed uh, unanimously uh, a resolution to authorize the, the president, the nation to go to war against the, the Taliban. Uh, and while there might have been a brief debate, again, the, the sense was we were all in this ur urgent situation together. I think the president has been trying to, I think that's when people really do set aside their differences and come together in that way. And I, I agree with Senator Grahams. I think a lot of the differences we have are legitimate and they're genuine and, and they're healthy. That's what a democracy is about. Uh, and I think the president is trying and, and not yet successfully to, to, even though we are obviously in, in a serious uh, critical economic situation, to, to, to get beyond the partisanship and get to that we, you know, united together, and, and he hasn't succeeded yet. Thank you, Mark. Congressman Kennedy, you are, spent your whole career in the House uh, at, in Washington. Uh, you are surrounded here by a bunch of former senators. How does the House fit into this story of growing polarization that so many people have commented on in the last 25 years? Well, I think it plays a different role because the rules in the House are different than in the Senate. In the House, majority wins all the time. In three terms in Congress, six years, there was maybe three votes that we as the majority lost that we really cared about. Uh, whereas in the Senate, each senator has a strong negative influence. You can put a block on something, you can stop, and so you have to work together. But, but I'd just like to address a couple of issues from it. First of all, has it always been thus? Mm -hmm. uh, I always enjoyed giving constituents a tour of the chamber of the Capitol. And if you go in the chamber, they got a bunch of pictures around there. One of the first ones you take them to, and then you ask them, did they pay attention to their history class? You say, is this the Constitution or is it the Declaration of Independence? And most don't get it right. And I say, how do you know? And it's Washington. And if he's there, it's the Constitution. If he's not there, it's the Declaration of Independence. And you ask them, where was Washington? And they Fighting. forgot that we actually had to fight a war to get our independence. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them, but you go in the chamber in the rotunda and it's the Declaration of Independence. And if you look at the picture of the five committee members there, the interesting thing you point out is the artist wanted to show that there was conflict between Jefferson and Adams. And I say, how can you, how can you find it? And usually people can't find it, but if you look, he showed Jefferson's foot going abnormally out of its way to be stepping on Adams' foot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you think of those as friends. They both died in the 50th anniversary yeah. uh, of the yep. Declaration of Independence, but they had conflict. Uh, the other interesting thing is uh, I went, uh, I'm bipartisan, I went to the Kennedy School uh, for the training for new congressmen. Uh, I, I found out I actually gave seven cents uh, to the Kennedy Library when I was young, like six years old, which was all I had, and they gave, uh, they gave half of that to the 
politics institute at Harvard, so I said, you know, you get what you pay for. I paid three cents. I, <laughs> I got three cents worth of conservative there. But, but we had David McCullough. <laughs> we had David McCullough, and if you haven't read his books on Truman or on John Adams, they're excellent. And, and he went through and he says, what we have today is tame compared to what it was in the early parts of our, our country. We had presidential you know, races that went to the Senate and all the haggling that went around there, so it has been. The second thing is there's less of it than you think. Uh, when you, all of I think here can tell you, we don't act that, we're not screaming and hollering at each other all the time in the House or the Senate, but conflict sells papes. So if there's 435 members of the Congress and, uh, you know, 400 of them are behaving themselves and you have 15 on one side shooting arrows and 15 on the other side shooting arrows, guess who the cameras are covering? They're covering the ones that are shooting at each other, whereas everybody else is sitting there trying to figure out, what do we have in common? What can we work on? Uh, I had 20 different Democrats that I led bills on. Over half the Democrats in the House co-sponsored one of my bills. And I'd always say there may be only one out of 100 issues we can work on, but we can work on that. Uh, I think whether this is going to be bipartisan is in many ways going to depend on Obama. Uh, he's, he's had some smart moves in that and, and some that have been a bit more challenging. Well, Rah Rahm Emanuel, I would say, as chief of staff, gives us hope that he can actually execute it. Well, thank you, Congressman Kennedy, because you've given me a terrific segue into what I wanted us to do next. We've talked a bit about the past, the backdrop, the experience that each of these good folks had when they were serving, and now let's talk about this present moment, folks, and, and about the, uh, the new president and his efforts in the past two and a half, three weeks to at first court the Republicans and then scold the Republicans and try to generate some kind of bipartisanship on the stimulus package so far to not much good result. Can a president really be an agent for bipartisanship in Washington today? Who wants to start with that? Oh, okay. Senator Durenberger, seniority ranks. Uh, leave seniority it to rules. defer to somebody else. But um, one of the things that, that I recall discovering, and I think everybody probably has, is that, um, and somebody's already remarked on it, how we overplay our differences and how journalism, in effect, overplays um, differences. And uh, one of the things that often gets overplayed is uh, the contest between the President and the Congress. And uh, one of the things I discovered that when you get, whether it's in crises or it's in a situation where you have a difficult time deciding even among your own colleagues, that the President provides cover for some tough votes uh, quite often. And so the strength and the consistency of presidential leadership on issues uh, becomes really, really important. And that implies, I think, uh, a presidency that is organized. And I'm, I'm glad to hear Mark say what he said about uh, Rahm Emanuel. And I, I never served with him, but I have a similar impression, <laughs> is that um, you ha somebody has to bring out the strength of those two bodies because they're a lot stronger than they look at, like, from a distance. <clears throat> and somebody has to bring out those strengths. And a president who has, say, the personal gift of doing it, but is staffed in a way so that timing and pick the right issue and uh, go with the right kind of leadership and so forth can really make a difference. And so for me, I'm going to judge um, partisanship, if you will, on the part of either minority or majority um, six months or a year from now. I, I, I don't intend to judge it. Right now we're pouring um, new wine into old wineskins, basically, okay. with bailouts and, and stimuli and things like that, and it's, it's much too early to make me judge. Well, how important is it, after all, that this stimulus package be a, a national rather than a partisan product? Is that important, Representative Grams? Well, it is, but did, were you talking yes, about Yes, I am. Okay, let me just first mention about the, the partisan and bipartisanship. And it was surprising how many times Paul Wellstone and I, who were considered the bookends of the Senate, mm -hmm. I was among the most conservative, Paul was listed as the most liberal. Mm -hmm. But how many times we were able to work together on a lot of issues that the press never covered. And as Mark said, it's when you came down to issues where you were very much at odds and feisty about it is when you got the coverage and even some editorial writers would write it up, Lori, believe it or not. And, uh, and uh, yes, she yes. managed to bring out the worst in me. Of her. <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> and, uh, Not me personally, of course. <laughs> but uh, and when you mention Rob Emanuel, Rom uh, is a very feisty guy. And when uh, President Obama picked him, he picked him mainly because Rom is a street fighter. Rom is a guy who gets things done. He was basically running the house, uh, whether Pelosi liked it or not. But that's the kind of guy Rahm Emanuel is. And, uh, but he's also a guy who said, never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> and he was looking at the problems with the economy and what they were going to be able to do through fear, saying right now you hear this is the worst catastrophe since the Great Depression, the country is going to collapse unless we do something. Everything being talked about is to scare Americans, I believe, into signing on to a bill that is not a good bill for this country. It's not taking us in the direction. And there we go into the partisanship again. Can we get a bill that's bipartisan? Well, it's like ordering a pizza. And if you're the one ordering the pizza, you're in the majority over here, and you all love anchovies. And you're going to put anchovies on this pizza, whether anybody likes it or not. Over here are the Republicans who do not like anchovies. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to take part of this pizza. And you say, no, I'm not putting in an order that's got anchovies in it. And you say, oh, no, it's going to have anchovies. So right now, we've got President Obama and the Democratic leadership ordering the pizza. And it's coming with anchovies. So. <laughs> And luckily, there's only three Republicans who like anchovies. We saw every member of the House say no. We saw all except three in the Senate say no. And again, I think this is healthy because this, this bill, even though right now the President wants to call it bipartisan, uh, Harry Reid wants to call it bipartisan because they got three Republicans on it. This is President Obama's bill. This is the Democratic bill. And if it works, they're going to get all the credit in the world. And if it doesn't work, they're going to have the millstone around their neck. So they're in charge. They're ordering the pizza. Let's see how it tastes. Okay. Well, Mark, well I don't know if that means you well, like anchovies the, or not. But. I was say, for, for, for the record, I can't stand anchovies, but we'll... <laughs> But, but, the, but the, points, the points still well taken. <laughs> Mark, do you share that yeah. statement? Do you share that assessment that this is a, a, a democratic bill and should it be an, an all-democratic bill? Well, I think, again, it goes in part to the, you know, the role the, of partisanship and the, and the role of Congress. I remember I, I'm a, I was always been fascinated with the Niagara Falls. And so I remember reading with interest that back in 1859 and 1860, they had these two incredible people who could walk across the falls. They, if you've ever been there, they strung a wire, a rope or something across the falls, below the falls, across the gorge. These guys walked at these high wire things. And Abraham Lincoln and his wife had been up there for one of those two summers. Uh, uh, it must have been 59 before he got campaigning. And, and I don't know if they, uh, he, he used that analogy. And he said, if, you know, if, if you have the President of the United States walking across Niagara Falls on the high wire, carrying the, the nation, and this said this during the Civil War, so we really were in a crisis. He said, has, has the nation on his shoulder, uh, shoulders, you wouldn't expect somebody to go up there and start plucking the wire to try to knock him off. But that's how he felt as president back then. And I think as, as, you know, as Rod said, I mean, we're, we're human. So we're all uh, subject in politics. I say there are no saints in politics. They're only shades of sinners. Probably an appropriate thing to say in an institution like this. And, you know, <laughs> certainly we all have shades. But, you know, been beyond that, as, as Rod said, you know, we have fundamental differences of, of what we think is the right or wrong policy, of, of ideology, of geography, and, and all that comes into play. So, you know, whether bipartisanship in, in this instance is a good thing or a bad thing depends on whether you like the Senate bill before uh, three Republicans and Ben Nelson and I guess Joe Lieberman, uh, who, you know, slashed uh, 20 billion, whatever it was, for school construction and 40 billion for uh, assistance to states like Minnesota who are in desperate financial shape. And we can have honest disagreements whether that improves the bill or makes it worse. Uh, but that's the nature of the process, and that's why, you know, the requirement in the Senate where you have to have 60 votes, which is a very high threshold, uh, and, and the way that's employed by both parties, whoever happens to be in the minority, to thwart legislation and, and thwart the will of the majority is, again, uh, I think, in the eye of the beholder. 
Mark Kennedy, let me invite you to do some second guessing. How do you think this last 10 days might have been handled differently by the new president? Well, I would first of all not overplay the last 10 days because let's say we had Rip Van Winkle that fell asleep a century ago and he woke up today and you told him uh, we have a trillion dollar deficit and the Democrats want to spend about another trillion more and the Republicans don't. Would he think that that was due to excessive partisanship in America, he would say that the world seems to be in balance. Uh, so don't put too much weight on trying to move from a very partisan environment to all of a sudden having people go completely out of whatever comfort zone they're in. Um, sec first thing. Second thing, there was bipartisan. There was bipartisan opposition to the bill in the House. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that really gives a road map to Obama because Pelosi, Reid, and all the committee chairmen collectively are far more liberal than the tack he appears to be taking, and, and frankly, far more partisan than the tack he takes. So it's the really his ability to keep them from making this too much of a partisan fight that's going to be the challenge. And he kind of, in this case, maybe because he had to do it in a hurry, outsourced it to Pelosi, and he got bipartisan opposition. Rom, as I said, is the key, because he has to try to figure out a way to work with all these people and getting working together. And, and Obama is going to have to seriously say, can we have it be half anchovies and half, what do Republicans like to eat? Uh, Pepperoni. Meat. Pepperoni. <laughs> meat lovers. <laughs> uh, on the other side, let me, just tell, that let me just tell you one Rom story as to how good he is. Uh, I, I deliberately, when I left Congress, made sure that I was not a lobbyist which has many advantages because you can still go on the House floor. But we passed a bill to clean things up, no lobbyists on the floor. So I'm back last uh, August uh, visiting with all my fellow members of Congress on the House floor. About a minute after Rom caught my eye, somebody from the sergeant at arms desk comes over to check on me to make sure that I'm not a lobbyist. But, you know, he's very methodical. He's, uh, he's uh, I, you know, a lot of folks don't like him. I, I don't know, but he's good. And so we're hoping that he can help Obama truly find the ways to thread the needle between the parties. Just the fact we didn't get it done on the, on the, on the stimulus bill shouldn't be a, a permanent indictment that it can't oh, be done. Sorry. Okay, Senator my Durbin, my favorite second. story about Rahm Emanuel is uh, that uh, he was described as somebody for whom the F word is a noun, a verb, and an adjective. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when the president previously, a couple of years ago, roasted, roasted Obama, uh, Rahm at an event, Rahm cut off the part of his middle finger uh, in a, as an Arby's worker as a teenager, and thus, uh, as President Obama said, practically muted him. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Dernberger wanted in on this. Yeah, right. Yeah. You want to follow that, Senator Dernberger? <laughs> Just a comment on Andrew. <laughs> There are very few anchovy lovers in this room, but there are probably more Democrats. I like them. Anchovy. But uh, no, if, if uh, I, and I agree with what everyone has said, but if Rip Van Winkle was got here at last September 17th and he watched this thing, if he watched a Democratic uh, Congress vote to do what it didn't want to do but had to do, and that is support a Republican president whom a lot of Republicans wouldn't support in trying to save the banking industry in this country. Now, was it the right thing to do? Was it w whatever it is? He did it. And he was supported by both candidates for, or they were supported by both candidates. And, and I think the stimulus falls in about the same category. And, and um, I always remember that what Ted Mita, the pol political science professor from M Mac, told me when I got elected. And he said, God, Dave, you're so lucky you're in the minority, you know. <laughs> all, you, all you have to do, you vote with the majority when they're right, you vote against them when they're wrong, and you stay there forever. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of like the way I interpreted uh, what's been going on there now and the bipartisan period, if we get to that in our conversation sometime, will be when we start the t heavy lifting on health reform, education reform, energy, national security, some of the really... The, the things that change the wines, the, you know, the, the wineskins, that's, that's when Republicans and Democrats start to 
look well, a lot better than they do. Again, a lovely segue, Senator. Thank you very much. And we're going to invite the audience to participate in just a minute, but I would like you to each give us a minute or so, no more than that, on, on, on this, this, the nut graph uh, that uh, I'm always asked for by my editors. They want the, what's the nut of the story? What's the real meat? What's the real question? What difference does it make whether Congress is functioning in a, a collegial, part, uh, bipartisan, national governance mode versus a polarized partisan mode? What difference has that made for all of us? Mark Kennedy, you're the most recent person there. Tell us, what difference does it make? Well, uh, what difference does it make is that it, it's so hard to get 60 votes in the Senate, as uh, Mark Dayton just said. And so we, we oftentimes found we'd pass something in the House and it'd just die in the Senate. If you don't need government to do anything, that's just fine. Uh, but if you do need it to do something, it's not fine. And uh, this country, you know, is probably never going to send enough of one party, we've come close now, to do it all themselves. But there are, I think, ways that we can work together, and it, it requires finding pieces of peace. So it's part anchovy, part meat lovers. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the interesting things, for example, is uh, in Australia, they've come up with a structure to address Social Security that the conservatives in Australia opposed when they put it in there because it had a mandate. But then when the conservatives got in power, they didn't remove the mandate to save 9% of your earnings for retirement. But they created choices, and they let you invest in whatever you want. So it was a blend of liberal and conservative. In a similar way, promising things for me, whether you agree with all the parts or not, when Romney did Massachusetts care, I'm not saying I'm for Massachusetts care, but he deliberately picked, here's some liberal ideas, here's some conservative ideas. Can we marry them together so that you have pieces that appeal to both sides? And, and Obama or somebody is going to have to come through and try to give them the path to do that if we're going to solve things like immigration. You know, we've got a lot of folks on both sides of the aisle that want to get that done. There are some of the tough issues that I think, if we truly put our mind to it, we can solve. Would like to add something to that. I would agree with what Mark just said about you know the diff uh, and I you know you're more conversant about how the House acts and the Senate, but you know I, I think people want action, they want results, and then they'll judge us individually and collectively by those results. I mean, uh, in a sense, I, again, I would argue that the president was just elected with a mandate, and, and there's a strong majority uh, in both the House and the Senate that uh, that they ought to have anchovies. And then people can see whether that turns out to be a good pizza or not, uh, and can in two years and then four years uh, judge accordingly. But but I, I think, you know, what, what, what I hear people say when they say bipartisan is it's a, you know, what they really mean is we want results. Now, I, I mean, the, and the, the longer the process gets extenuated with, uh, and, and it's been well said, you know, the, the 15 on each side shooting arrows, the more people do get a, a distorted impression of what really happens day by day in terms of getting the, the, the institutions to function. But the bottom line is people want the, the decisions to be made and actions to be taken that are going to make their lives better. And if anybody had the, the magic crystal ball that could look into our situation today and say this is the, the, the correct direction for the country, I mean, it would be unanimous. But it's just it's much more complicated than that. Yeah. But ultimately, you're going to be able to hold people accountable. And I think this gets in the way of that. Representative Kennedy and, and Senator Dayton suggested that uh, immigration has been, uh, reform has been slowed by this polarization uh, reform of entitlements, Social Security, Medicare. Anything you'd like to add to that list, Senator uh, Grams and Senator Durberger? Well, I think there are shades of gray, but not many. I, I think there's more black and white. And when we're talking about, you know, partisanship and, and holding accountability, this bill is going to pass. So if that's what the public wants, they're going to get a stimulus bill. The question now is, and that's probably for history to decide, is it good or is it bad? But they're going to get a bill, and I see nothing wrong with Republicans disagreeing that this is not the track that we should be going on. And in fact, there was more Democrats that voted against the bill than there were Republicans voting for the bill. So uh, I, I just think that uh, there are more shades of black and white in a way a lot of people think. And especially when you're elected, and you're going out there, I mean, where do you draw the line between pro-life, pro-choice? There's no gray. There's black and white. And, and many other issues like that that you've got to take a stand on and that you believe is right for the country. And like I said, a lot of good people out there are Democrats and Republicans. And I had a lot of respect for all of them. We had maybe different opinions, different views, different directions. But we want to make sure that we have good, honest, open debates. And not personal. Don't attack. I mean, because we can all... Uh, you know, stake out our position on an issue and then still go out and have a beer. I mean, that's 
the way it, but I will say this quickly, Laurie, before we get to the audience questions. Talking to Bob Michael, he said that back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, he thought it was more, uh, better relations between Democrats and Republicans than there were from the 90s through the early parts of this century. And he said a lot of the work, though, got done in the committee chairman's office, not on the floor. And that's where people would really go to work together, have sandwiches and a couple of drinks. And believe it or not, they would get things done. And when they went to the floor, they had an agreement reached. So, I mean, there's different ways of getting things done. And, uh, but uh, like I say, I'm never afraid of a debate and I'm never afraid of the final vote. Let the chips fall where they may, and then let the American people decide. And it might take history to decide. And evidently, they wanted a big change. They say, get rid of the last eight years. Well, now we're into the Obama era, and we'll see how that you know, pans out. If they like it, that's fine. And if they don't, we'll have a change coming up in four or eight years. So, Senator Durenberger, do you agree that we have to have either white or black, is, or is there some gray that would be good for the country? Um, <clears throat> well, gray's not all bad, um, <laughs> and um, I get a little bit. Just yeah, like right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to just made, may add another dimension, um, um, one that Mark reminded of me. Uh, by picking immigration, that's not a Republican or a Democratic issue. I mean, that that has a very different cut to it, and um, and it, it gets at some of the not so nice side of Americans and so forth, even though we're all immigrants, it gets at that. And I think um, you can choose issues like that and really start to, you know, bring uh, regions of the country even and, and, and the people together. But the, the second one that was impressive to me uh, in the last couple of years was watching the fact that there were people in the United States Senate who um, realized that uh, as soon as the two, particularly when it became clear that John McCain and Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton would likely be the next president, that this would be the first time since 1960 60. that a president came out of the Senate. United States Senate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that began to happen <clears throat> is that Republican and Democratic senators who weren't running were getting together to say, this might be the time we can take on you know, name a really complex issue, and like Ron Wyden and Bob Bennett chose to do on health care. Mm -hmm. They put the bill together, and a lot of people already signed up on it. Um, and that might be one of those um, um, areas, given the fact that uh, Barack Obama has come from the Senate, and uh, people have respect for that's the place where the national interest might find quickest bipartisanship that um, he might and we all might be able to build. Or well, truth of it, Dave, is they thought if they lose one senator, I'll get a better seat on finance. That's what they were thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you Insights. think? Inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think, audience? Is this uh, partisan culture we have in Washington good for the country or not? I'm interested in hearing your questions. And there's a microphone in the back, and some hands are up here. And there may be another microphone close at hand. Let's get started with your comments and questions. Please, uh, if you'd uh, care to direct your question to a particular panelist or several panelists, or say you want to hear from them all, in order to keep things moving, I like it when you designate a particular panelist you'd like to hear from. So let's do that. Here we go. Please tell us your name and where you're from. <clears throat> My name is Nick Peters. I uh, am from St. Cloud. And this question is probably more uh, appropriate for Mark Kennedy. Um, one of the most interesting conversations I've had this year was about um, the unorthodox procedures in Congress. And in light of getting things done, um, how do you feel about um, some of the procedures, such as omnibus legislation, uh, multi-committee referral, or bypassing committees? Does this is this a valid and legitimate way to get things done in Congress um, and in the House? Uh, does this threaten democracy, or does this uh, increase partisanship to a dangerous level? Yes. Now, well, for the sake of the, let me just interrupt you. For the sake of those in your in the audience here who are not political scientists, give us a little bit of, a, of an explanation of what those new procedures are all about. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this one's some brownie, brownie points for Claire Haig. Um, but put that into, into, non, into layman's terms, please. It, well, when the committees are bypassed um, and 
to speed things up, they would there's options to rid the significance of the committee and put things on the floor in a quick manner. Um, and that's probably one of my biggest concerns because it seems to threaten democracy to some extent and democracy in the legislation and in the House. And um, omnibus legislation is when uh, many different things are tagged on, onto a bill that aren't necessarily related Jermaine. or relevant to Jermaine. the issue at hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay. yeah. Thank you for that explanation. And Mark Kennedy, this one's yours. Uh, they're both bad. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but when you think about it, we, it's kind of intriguing me that we said the, the reason that bipartisanship is bad is because it keeps you from getting things done. Both of those allow you to get things done. And so you really need to step back and you need to ask yourself, is it about getting things done or getting the right things done? You know, remember I started out by saying that uh, we only lost three times in six years? Uh, at least one or two of those were due to those procedures. So if one party controls it, actually, uh, they can be a means of bipartisanship. Because if the party chair controls the committee, you're not getting it through there if it's anti your party. Uh, one of those, for example, was campaign finance reform, which, uh, look what good it's done is. Uh, you know, it was a discharge petition, and it would have never gone through the committee structure, so it came out. Uh, on, on the omnibus, omnibuses are ugly. Uh, and the bad thing about must-pass legislation is that they become Christmas trees, and everything under the sun has to go in there, and you can't not vote for them. And if you do vote, ag you, if you vote against them, then there's a whole bunch of good things there you're voting against. So to have clean up or down, I'm for this, I'm against that, is a far better way to pass legislation. It makes it harder for legislation to get done. And a lot of times, if, you, if your budget process is out of control, the only way they can do it is omnibus. But I hate omnibuses, and if they were outlawed, I'd be a happy camper. Can I just add to that, because I was in there? Yes, you were a House member, too. And I, I never dis, uh, disagreed with discharge, discharge petitions. I thought they were good. It was a way to get around committees and other things where you couldn't move the legislation, but you still needed the full body to vote up or down. So all you bypassed was a committee and maybe some amendments and things in it, but it still needed the floor to vote yes or no. But the omnibus bill, I agree with you, because uh, that is, I mean, it's been a work of art uh, why the president never had line item veto, I believe, is because I think the original members of the Congress never thought of putting an omnibus bill together. But once they found out about it, it it's so easy, like, he, like Mark said, to build a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. And then you're torn between do I vote against some good things to get rid of this or don't I? And no matter how you vote, you're going to have people mad at you. And, uh, but it's a way of shoving through uh, legislation that or spending bills that shouldn't be done. In the Minnesota legislature, it has actually been some Supreme Court rulings that has been a check on that. Mm -hmm. Have there ever been, Senator Dernberger, who's been watching this longer than the others, has there ever been a Supreme Court ruling striking down a bill because it ha was encompassing too many topics? I don't think so. No. That, that is, I think, one of the ways around this. Okay. Yeah. Here we, someone else has the mic. On, on the flip side, if I caught on the committee, you know, bypassing, although the House has different rules, but, you know, the problem is, as I agree with Senator Graham's, uh, you know, committee really accentuates the power of, like, you know, one, one member or maybe two, one or two to thwart the whole will. And I can, the, one of the most instructive campaign commercials I ever saw, and this is verbatim because I watched it several times with Russell Long was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee who was running for re-election in Louisiana. He was reminding people what he'd done for them. He said, well, I remember the day that I got the funding for the Tuckabee River Dam for the people of Louisiana, which I guess got 99% federal funding. He said, President Kennedy called me the White House. He said, Senator, I called you here to talk with you about my nuclear test ban treaty. And I said, well, Mr. President, I'm here to talk with you about the Tuckabee River Dam for the people of Louisiana. The President Kennedy said, well, Senator, what on earth does the Tuckabee River Dam have to do with my nuclear test ban treaty? And I said, well, Mr. President, the way I see it, it's like this. There are seven members of the committee who are for your bill, and there's seven members opposed, and then there's me. So I'd say the Tuckabee River Dam has a lot to do with your nuclear <laughs> test ban treaty. That's verbatim. And <laughs> Probably went just about like that, too. Okay, someone else here has the microphone. Go ahead. <laughs> Please say your name and where you're from. Oh, I'm uh, Alex Kurt. I'm from Egan. <clears throat> Uh, for any or all of you, I've noticed there are no um, third party or minor party or independent party members sitting on the panel tonight. And I've wondered, 
um, if any of you would comment on the role that you think third parties or minor parties can play in um, mm. bipartisanship or partisanship, if they'd be mediators like they claim, or if they would exacerbate the problem and maybe how the panel would benefit or not from having Jesse Ventura sit on it. <laughs> well, no, that, just a sec here. Mark Dayton ran for governor, am I right about this, in 1998, my memory serving, and I believe Jesse Ventura won that year, so I think he's got standing to answer this one. <laughs> what about a tripartisan approach? Is that a way to, to move some of these issues along? Well, I, I, I mean, I don't, I, you can debate that one either way. It, it, you know, it, it, it has advantages, it has disadvantages. Uh, Tim Pawlenty has now been elected and then re-elected governor of Minnesota with uh, it was 44 and 45 percent of the vote. If uh, Peter Hutchinson had not been running as independent the last time, I think arguably Mike Hatch would have won. Uh, on the other hand, you know, in the uh, democracy, you know, there shouldn't be a, an exclusive monopoly of two parties. If, if the people want more than two parties, uh, this last time Dean Barkley got 17 percent of the vote, whatever, because people <coughs> were dissatisfied with the other two candidates. I mean, that's that's the essence of democracy. Uh, so, I, you know, again, I, it depends on each situation. I don't know that it's inherently better one way or, or the other, but I, again, I think that the people have a lot to say about that. If the people find another candidate, Jesse Ventura won the election because of his force of personality, and, uh, not because of the strength of the Independence Party. But he institutionalized the in Independence Party in Minnesota because it now gets more than 5% of the vote, so we effectively have three-party representation in, in just about every major election uh, since then. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on, again, uh, the outcomes, whether whether you agree or disagree. Uh, Senator Grams, you want to get on this one? Well, I just wanted to add that, you know, sometimes I feel like the third party. We've got Democrats, we've got Republicans, and then we've got conservatives. And uh, sometimes I can't find a home on many of the issues. And when I look at some of the votes going on in Washington and some of the issues, I can't uh, side with the Democrats, and I can't side with those people calling themselves Republicans. I'm looking for conservatives. And uh, so sometimes I feel like a third party. Well, and Senator Durenberger, have you sometimes felt like you're in a third party? No, I just think I got classified as a rhino or something, whatever the, the right-wing <laughs> talk radio uh, characterization is. But, um, and I, I was hoping we'd get to the discussion like this because um, I think what's, what's going on is defining what you stand for, basically. And that's why you said what you said about mm -hmm. conservative. Um, and... Um, one of the challenges that we all have in both parties, um, uh, say an ultra-left Democratic and an ultra-right Republican, as they currently seem to stand, is that if you really say what you stand for, you know, and you're willing to articulate it and you've served at some other level of government, it's pretty darn hard to get endorsed unless you endorsed one of the add-on principles to the conservatives. Now, I know he's a conservative because I watched him vote. I watched him vote against his own interests. When it was earmarks for something or other or flood control, you know, giveaways that he didn't believe in. So I know that on the principle of the role of government and being responsible and if you're going to spend the money, you better be able to raise it. I know this guy is a conservative. But if the ticket says pro-abortion or anti-abortion and that's the definition of a conservative, forget it. You know, we'll never get representative democracy in this country and we'll never get the kind of cross-section that anybody um, really deserves. I've endorsed instant runoff voting so that you take everybody will vote for their first, second, and third choice. And if this, you know, one of those happens to be an independent or a green or whatever it is, at least that person is going to have some opportunity if we can mute some of the influence of $40 million campaigns for the two major parties. That person is going to have an opportunity to get some exposure to the day from either the Democrat or the Republican Party because they can't even get on ticket. Senator, I think that instant runoff voting is something that if you don't know about already, you're going to hear more about. So take another 30 seconds and explain to folks what instant runoff voting is. Yeah, and it, <clears throat> it's it probably, if, you th if we think about it, it's, it's going to happen in Minneapolis, and we'd like to see it happen in St. Paul. And it's, if it starts at the local level, it's easier to understand and identify the candidates and so forth. But what you do is vote for your three choices. And if none of the three choices for that office gets 50%, then you take into, on the first on the first first choice and nobody gets 50 percent then you add in everybody's second choice and if nobody gets 50 percent then you add in everybody's third choice and somebody will be a winner at that point but someone will represent you 
who has a prefer as for, for whom the electorate has expressed 50% of the electorate has expressed uh, the, as their choice. Representative uh, Kennedy, you look like you want in on this. What do you think of instant runoff voting? Uh, I, I don't know that I have a view. I mean, I I am not a poli sci major. I took one poli sci class. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think on the whole issue of of third parties, barring something like this, it is not going to be meaningful in the political structure that we have. In a parliamentary structure, they've been very strong. You'd have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And as you get down to getting legislation through, is it going to help? Is it going to hurt? I don't know. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't have a definitive point of view on, on, on that runoff, but I, I would say a couple of things. I would say that uh, there's a long history of people being at odds with their party. I had a talk with a group of people earlier, and I told them my three heroes are Churchill, Teddy Roosevelt, and John F. Kennedy. All three of them fought with their parties all the time. You know, so the angst you're hearing Senator Graham and Senator Nuremberger talk about is, is natural. Churchill was in the outs with his party for a whole decade. Uh, I, I mentioned that the Tory in charge, Baldwin, then when they asked, you know, what would happen if he died, he said, this is his own party chair, you know, embalm, a cremate, and bury, take no chances. <laughs> You know, uh, but but I, I do want to bring up one thing about Jesse. If you look at the leadership Jesse showed as governor, it's a it's a textbook example for what we don't want Obama to do. Because what he did was look at those Republicans and Democrats; they can't get along. Well, why do we elect the governor? We elect the governor to invite them both over to mansion and say, okay, the three of us, Republican or whatever the head of the house is, whatever the head is, we're not leaving here until we figure something out. And so that was the classic stand in the middle and shoot arrows at both parties. And, and all of you that hate partisanship loved it. And so he was popular. But we cannot have that kind of leadership from Obama if we're going to have the kind of progress we need in this time in the country. Obama has to be a invite both sides, all, all sides in, and say, OK, what can we agree on? We're not leaving the room until we get there. Thank you for that comment. Who's got the microphone now? How about over on that side of the room? Yes. Great. Please say your name and where you're from. Um, my name is Tony Savello. I'm from Shoreview, Minnesota, in the Twin Cities. Um, and to touch on the immigration issue that was discussed earlier, um, I'm interested in how like bipartisanship, you, or like your views on bipartisanship, and how that Obama will move the ball forward in immigration at this time. Obviously, there's other stressing issues for the country, as the economy crisis and uh, the war. But this isn't really directed at anyone in particular. Just like to see your views. Well, Mark Kennedy raised it earlier, so that puts him on the spot no, now. I, I think there's a prime opportunity here. If you looked in the Senate, we had both presidential candidates, McCain and Obama, were for legislation that took an approach. Uh, so whatever your whatever your uh, view is on this, and you're not going to have everybody happy, but. Rather than try to say the stimulus bill is a test for whether you can have bipartisanship in the Congress, where there's huge partisan divides, uh, I think where each party is divided within, itse within itself on these, that you can coalesce a group from each party together to get a pressing problem done. There are lots of things wrong, but the current state of affairs is worse than either, just about any outcome you can imagine. So I'm, I'm hopeful. And this has always been a country of immigration. You know, part of my big issue is I'm very pro-trade for any number of reasons, because it's good for our economy, it's good for the world's economy, it's good for peace. If goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. And in that very competitive global marketplace, America needs to be a magnet for talent. And I want all that best talent and that hungry talent to come into America, because that's going to make us stronger. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this is one of the areas where he gets that gears of bipartisanship moving and, and moves the country forward. And should he do that this year, or is this one of those second-tier issues that can wait? What do you think? Well, the problem is is you have to get people some practice. There hasn't been a lot of practice at doing right. things in a bipartisan fashion. Right. So rather than pick the toughest one and say, this is what we're going to do, <laughs> I'm saying set the bar a little bit lower for bipartisanship and give some experience to people saying, that didn't hurt that bad now, did it? Mm -hmm. and, and then go from there. Okay. So I would if I were him, because he needs some early wins to try to put this up front. I'm conscious of the clock. Let's see if we can go fast with several questions that go to one or, or, or two panelists only. Let's start right here. All right, I'm Ashley Leach, and I'm from Wilmer, Minnesota. And um, my question is, I guess for all of you, but you know, 
whoever wants to answer it the most, I guess, can go at it. But um, in, in Congress class, we um, read some scholars that said that comedy in the House and Senate has decreased um, for one of the reasons because um, senators and House members just aren't in Washington as much as they were before. They used to be in the Capitol and they would go to dinner parties together and they would be there for the weekends. But now everyone is shipping out to go back to their home districts so that they can have more of a presence in their district for re-elections and such. And so my question is, do you really feel that this is um, a reason for increasing or decreasing comedy in the House that, or House and Senate that um, senators and House members aren't in Washington as much as they used to be? Senator Durenberger, yeah, that change happened on your watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, you've got a book that talks about who caused yes. it to happen. Here, here I, folks, I, I don't need to refer to that, but. I have all my, uh, uh, good book to plug. No, so damn much money. Brand off, new off the press is Robert G. Kaiser of the Washington Post. Senator Durenberger recommended I read it. It's wonderful. Tells you a lot about what's changed in Washington. Um, anyway, when. Um, when um, Rudy and I were elected, um, we uh, first thing we did was um, go to Washington, try to find some real estate we could afford, and both of us had four boys, and so it meant we had to look in, in an area in which we could also afford um, the education as well. And so immediately, we got to know a lot of our new colleagues because it was a matter of bringing your family. And when you're bringing your family, um, you're going to raise them up in Washington, D.C., as well as uh, at home, and that made a big difference. And so I lived through that period of time in which um, my softball team was playing um, Marty Sabos and beating them, and <laughs> then we'd all... Baseball. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, we did that. Um, it, it was a way in which leave aside, uh, go to the committee room and have a drink and, you know, that sort of thing. When, you ha when you're growing, raising your kids <laughs> and you're talking about Washington with people that have been there a long time and done it, it, and then when you get to be the one that they come and ask, you know, the next election around and so forth, it makes a huge difference in the way in which you relate to each other on some of these more uh, difficult issues. So. You asked me that question, and my automatic answer is um, when they made the decision that the way to stay in a permanent majority was to go home on Thursday afternoon and not have to come back until Tuesday morning and stay out there with your constituents and, blah, and that sort of stuff and run against Washington, D.C., and only show up to vote there for, for uh, a couple uh, days or three days out of a time, that was something I, I would think people might wish they could take back and maybe over time uh, leadership will, will, uh, will try to take back. But having said that, I'm as guilty as anybody because I think it was Bill Frenzel <coughs> that advised me about how to run against the Congress, you know. Mm -hmm. And all of us have done that. <laughs> you look at some of our newsletters and whatnot else. Uh, and that's a, that's a related topic. You know, you run against your job, you know, you run for this job in the Congress of the United States by tearing down the Congress of the United States, and then you expect it to work <laughs> when you get there. You know, it does not make a whole lot of sense, but that's been practiced by Republicans and Democrats for, for much too long. Mark Kennedy, you want to say a quick word, and then we're going to go on to I would to just say question. one way to solve that is one of the best ways to get to know other members is to travel with them. And we're, in a, we're the global leader in a global economy. Uh, unfortunately, we also demonize when members of Congress travel. But if you really want to get to know another member of Congress, even better than playing baseball with them, because all congressional trips have to be bipartisan, you spend seven or eight days going between six countries in the Middle East or whatever, and you really get to know them. So uh, don't just knee-jerk response, go against members of Congress because they're traveling. They should be traveling, and it's a great way to get to know members from the other party. Thank you for that word. Who's got the microphone now, folks? Way in the back. There we go. Thank you. Please say your name and where you're from. I'm Dave Goldwich, and I'm from Egan. Uh, why specifically, well, this is for Senator Dayton, Representative Kennedy. Why specifically hasn't President Obama gotten 
the bipartisanship, bipartisanship support that President Bush got during his crisis. How about that, Mark Dayton? Isn't this a crisis, perceived as a crisis in Washington in the same way that 9-11 was? Well, I don't know. I don't think it's the same kind of magnitude of crisis. I don't think it's per perceived as such. And you know, I, I think others have made the, the, the point in terms of some of the strategic moves. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think th this president doesn't yet uh, hasn't yet demonstrated as the way, say, a, a President Reagan did when he came in, that he has the, the skills. And I think he's the new new guy in town, and, and they're waiting to see how. Uh, you know, how, how well he performs, how well uh, Mr. Manuel performs, uh, you know, some of the dust-ups with the members of the cabinet, uh, former Senator Daschle especially, I think really, you know, distracted him, threw him off message at a, at a critical point in time. Uh, and I, again, I, I think the Republicans have moved very quickly uh, to the role of the opposition party uh, which is to, you know, raise, raise questions, raise, both for legitimate uh, ideological reasons and for strategic reasons, and uh, allow enough votes uh, to allow it to pass, as, as they did with the three Republicans who uh, joined with the, the Democrats to get to the culture. But I saw that on the other side, too. In fairness, I saw plenty of times when our caucus, when we were in the minority, President Bush, uh, where we were willing to have something passed that we voted against but could have blocked with enough votes to prevent uh, cloture and got the message from our leadership, no, we don't want to be obstructionists, we, we're going to let this pass. And as uh, others have said, then, you know, let the president and the majority party be responsible for 